So I want to just talk a little bit about how these endocrine disrupting chemicals do, in fact, have they been discovered to be endocrine disruptors? So Paracelsus back in, in the 1500s um, was sort of the father of toxicology and toxicologists use the expression dose makes the poison. Um, in other words, as you get exposed to a dose or an exposure of some kind, the more you're exposed, the more you're going to have the reaction that fits that, that exposure level. Um, I like to use with my high school students, uh, well, actually not my college students, actually not my high school students. Um, you know, if you drink a lot of alcohol, you're going to get sick, right? Dose makes the poison. Um, if you eat a lot of cake, you're going to maybe get a bellyache. Um, you know, so the dose makes the poison. Um, what was discovered almost haphazardly about 20 some years ago um, was that no one's ever bothered to look at the low, 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 low levels, the parts per million, parts per trillion levels of exposure until it was an accident. And what was discovered is even at the lowest, lowest doses, such, I mean, at the levels of what hormones run around the human body at those levels, you could see the same effects as the high dose exposures. And this was like dumbfounding um, because why would anyone look below those, those levels where you could start to visibly see a clinical change? And so as you can see, I think you can see my pointer, these were dose makes the poison kind of a linear and almost a nonlinear um, exposure um, graph. But when you look at um, hormones, as well as endocrine disruptors, you can see that it's almost like a U or a J, which is non-monotonic, meaning at low levels that no one ever bothered to look at, now we're looking, you can start to see some of the, of the changes, the responses, um, as similar to the high dose exposures. And that was alarming and something that the American chemical companies um, really fought to, um, to quiet. And so it's been a very insular area of research until now it's worldwide. So I mentioned periods of susceptibility. Um, so it's not just what one is exposed to, but also when. And this was um, also discovered in the literature that, um, again, those, those exposure periods um, when they're involved with lots of hormonal change going up or going down, as in the case with menopause, that is when perhaps these windows um, of more harm could take place. So um, when it comes to exposure during pregnancy, um, you know, we have the fetal um, alcohol uh, charts, which are very important. Um, we have a chart like this in, in our um, consumer book, Dr. Vamsal and I. We wanted to kind of show people that there are different time periods um, when different organs or different systems in the human body are developed in utero, in, in pregnancy. And you can see that there are certain areas where um, external genitalia is generally um, developed. Um, certainly the central nervous system goes all the way through for all of the weeks of uh, gestation. Um, and this is again, um, an alcohol exposure chart. Um, but when we talk about certain chemicals, we now know, uh, or classes of chemicals, we now know that they too can affect certain um, developmental uh, stages of in utero development. And this becomes pretty important because we now have incredibly high rates of autism, as we know. Um, in fact, I'm in New Jersey, where my practice is, and I grew up here, um, and we are one of the dirtiest states in the country, go Jersey. Um, we have one of the highest um, rates of autism. We have one of the highest rates of breast cancer incidence um, in terms of diagnosis. And um, we have the most super fun, <laughs> super fun sites of anywhere in the country, whether you wanna make those connections. Um, I don't have any specific ways to connect them, but um, I wanna just at least put that information out there. Um, and perhaps it'll come into play when we talk about other topics like drinking water, um, you know, in the U S as we're going to get into, but again, a lot of things contribute to this issue, nutrient value, et cetera. Um, but I wanted people to understand that it's not just even one class of chemicals that could have effects. Um, it's the mixture. It's the mixture of getting BPA from these products, um, preservatives from these foods, air quality, inhalation, um, being perhaps not nutrient sufficient to manage these chemicals, adding some stress, adding a dose of um, poor sleep, all of these things do contribute. So 
Um, I don't want anyone to be so scared that they're resistant to hearing the messages of change. Um, call to action on neurotoxin exposure. So um, this is a wonderful um, piece uh, that came out in, let me go back to my notes. Um, this came out in, uh, let's say July, 2016 issue of JAMA journal of the American medical association. It was a call to action, um, to reduce exposures to toxic chemicals that can contribute to the prevalence of neurodevelopmental disabilities in American children. Um, at that time, one in 68 children had autism spectrum disorder. That was the 2016 information. One in 10 U S children had ADHD. Uh, we now know from the 2018 uh, data that it's now one in 48 children has autism spectrum disorder nationally in New Jersey. I believe it's one in 32 um, as of 2018 data. So I'm just worried as all get out to see what the 2020 data looks like. Um, but I want people to think not just in terms of plastics, which um, is certainly a key contributor, but also the, the neurotoxins that are heavy metals. Um, and exposures to air pollution that turn into exposures that you wouldn't necessarily think of because you're inhaling it versus ingesting. Now, I did talk a, very briefly about transgenerational effects, which is, means that um, essentially whatever we do as adults or even as pregnant women specifically and pregnant, pre-pregnant men, I mean, men aren't off the hook. We now know that men are exposed to many chemicals and that contributes somewhat of risk towards their new or unborn fetus, I should say. Um, we do know that from with transgenerational effects that when a pregnant woman is exposed to anything, I mean, we know this, anything, including stress, right? The Dutch famine was a really interesting um, area to study in terms of um, famine during World War II and pregnant women who were exposed to severe famine versus those who weren't. We now know that those children develop health issues that were in the famine group much more so than those who were not. So in terms of stress of the mother, um, many exposures that affect a pregnant woman affect not just her, her body, but, not, but the fetus, a growing fetus. And then of course we have reproductive germ cells within the fetus that's growing within us. Um, babies, baby girls have all the eggs that they'll always have um, at the time of birth. Um, boys will have germ cells, will have the, the pre, precursor cells, the precursor structures that they will be using the rest of their lives in terms of um, their reproductive future. So again, there are literally three generations that are exposed to anything that a, pre, a female that's pregnant is exposed to, um, which is a little spooky, but we have to you know, really think about how we um, convey these messages um, to family, to um, colleagues, to patients, and so on. Um, so children are uniquely vulnerable, pound for pound, they're close to the ground, their hand to mouth behavior um, is very um, interesting because they do collect dust on their toys, dust that often has a lot of harmful chemicals, including phthalates, which are very high up on that list when it was studied, BPA, flame retardant chemicals, they land in dust um, and create a dust ball, cleaners, those kind of things. Um, and then they get stuck to the hands and toys. And this is the same for pets. I'm not sure people know my story. Um, but I tell the story in my book, um, I'll just hold it up, non-toxic. The introduction is all how I got into this. And it really began with the, um, the sad sickness of my golden retriever, my uh, firstborn. So I want people to think, you know, pets are just as vulnerable. We now know that cats certainly can get hyperthyroidism um, that was described um, and is now pretty common amongst house cats uh, due to endocrine disruption of many household chemicals. So children, they lack a variety of in their diet in terms of nutrients that are actually protective. Um, so they're very narrow diet. Um, their metabolism system is, is uh, metabolic system is very immature. Um, they don't quite have the stage two conjugation, um, you know, breakdown ability that adults have. Um, they're continuously developing. Um, so they're not really fully cooked. Um, and so these exposures can have particular um, health issues in terms of cognition, IQ. We've seen this with lead um, that was uh, taken out of uh, paints and gasoline um, in the 70s, 1978. But now we're seeing a resurgence, of course, of, of lead exposure from infrastructure. Um, and Flint was a prime example, but I'll talk about that. We have lots of other exposures to lead across the U.S., um, and they have many more years of future life ahead of them. So 
Um, you know, I talk about how I got introduced to sushi in my 20s. And I loved it. And what I realized is that had I been exposed to sushi like my two kids at age four, five, six, especially with the problems with our oceans in terms of quality of our fish, I, you know, I realized that that's a lot of reason why a lot of people perhaps are living very, very long old ages that were born in the turn of the century. So, you know, our exposure and what age and how long and for years of future, I think is very important to think about. Thank you.